going to be getting into some heavy hitters this month. The kind of jobs I've got to psych myself up for. We'll start off with some old Les Pauls. No, I'm not joking. Didn't misspeak. These are, in fact, Les Paul guitars. The story goes that the original 1950s models with the familiar Les Paul shape weren't selling very well at all. And by 1960, you know, people didn't want a burst, if you can believe it. They were heavy, they were expensive, they didn't give you that upper fret access you could get on some of the other solid bodies out there. And Les Paul's career was kind of sliding a bit too. He and Mary Ford were breaking up and his, his music was a little out of step with what was happening at the top of the charts at that time. Apparently Gibson went ahead and did a total redesign without consulting him, which would have been a thing for Les because, you know, he was a man of strong opinions. This is a flat plank this time, without the carved top on it. They're super light, they're very thin, they've got a double cutaway, it's a different neck angle, it's mahogany without the maple cap on top, and all these things give a different sound and a feel that Les just didn't get along with. The other thing is that he apparently couldn't get past the whippiness of the neck, because they're very thin necks, and the attachment point with the body is pretty tenuous in these early ones here. It's kind of weak. I mean, the tenon is reasonably long, but the way the pickup cavity route takes away so much of the material, a lot of its thickness is lost. And you're, if you're strong, it's really easy to produce like unintentional vibrato if you move the neck at all. So you see a lot of broken heels in these guitars. Les didn't like it, so he asked Gibson to take his name off the guitars and got out of his contract with them. I have a friend who suggests this may also have just been a ploy to decrease his net worth for the divorce proceedings with Mary Ford. That's not entirely out of character. Um, Les had a guitar tech, Tom Doyle, who worked with him for a lot of years, and he recounts that he was the kind of guy who would pocket all of the dinner rolls in the basket if he was out in a restaurant so he wouldn't have to buy lunch that week. So these Les Paul SGs, solid guitars, exist from 1961 to 1963. The cherry one here is a 61, first year of manufacture, and the white custom model here with the three pickups is a 62. Yeah, I know. Ouch. Funny story. This summer I received an email from a fellow who had seen this guitar on Reverb, and he wanted to know if I thought it could be fixed, because this has what's pretty clearly an unoriginal stinger, this pointy thing here. This is something Gibson did. They paint the back of the headstock and sometimes the heel as well to cover up a cosmetic issue in the wood. In this case, I was almost certain it was hiding a neck break. And I said, well, you know, I can take the paint off for you and you're going to see the damage instead. So really, you'd be spending money to reveal a flaw and it's always going to be a repaired headstock anyway. So maybe, you know, save a few bucks and just recognize it's a player's grade. It's not a collector's guitar. So you know, live with it. Enjoy the guitar for what it is. Someone else bought the guitar. And that someone also contacted me. Because, wonder of wonders, when he opened the case, the headstock was broken, and most of the stinger had popped right off. Now, he was in Texas, and I told him, you know, he should probably find someone closer to look after it. But in the interim, the first guy who emailed me talked to the second guy and arranged to buy the now clearly damaged guitar. So, He's also learned a few other things, too. Things like the pickups aren't original. They're old, but not the ones that came from the factory. That kind of thing. So, shipping damage, man. The job on this is to strip the paint, fix whatever horrors that reveals, including the stuff that's currently visible, then do some cosmetic touch-up. And I've told him that it will always look repaired, and this is just to keep things neat and tidy. Then there's this custom. It's white, which is kind of exciting. It's had some damage at the heel. Like I said, that's pretty common on these guys. It's been repaired and things are a bit scruffy looking. It's also got a crack here that was also fixed between the electronics cavity and the side of the waist, which isn't that uncommon. Um, there's not a whole lot of wood there, and if you drop one of these things, it can crack through. The other thing is some issues around the binding. All of the side dot markers have fallen out, and these cracks or fissures or whatever you want to call them along the lower edge of the binding here, when you rub your thumb or your fingers against them, it is quite annoying, so we do want to take care of those. The other, perhaps most vexing thing, is the bridge might not be in the right place. This happens from time to time during this era. 
maybe the body wasn't seated quite right in the jig when they put the thing on top and the holes were drilled. I saw an Epiphone Casino a few years ago where it was almost 3 16 of an inch off. So you can see that all of the saddles have been pushed to the back as far as they'll go. We'll see how closely it can be intonated and if need be we might plug and redrill to make this better. Finish repairs. I stay away from the full scale refinish jobs. It's just not my thing. Uh, I don't have the facilities. I'll do some small touch-ups if they're part of a bigger job, but like I say, I'm not brilliant at it. Not like some people I know. And there's a part of me that almost resists trying to develop that skill because it leads down a path I'm not sure I really want to go. I was watching a clip of Joel Wilkins the other day talking with Ian Davlin, both of whom are in that sort of I consider the grand master level of finish repair. Those of you who follow Matthew Scott on YouTube here probably saw the work that Joel did on, um, it was a 58 Les Paul special Matthew got from Goodwill. The work he did on that is darn near impossible to detect with a naked eye. And they were discussing how ethically compromised certain parts of the vintage guitar market is, such that if you can do a truly phenomenal finish repair, Many times it's not going to be disclosed when the guitar changes hands, and how some of that potentially can fall back on the repair person down the line, you know? I made a comment like, if you're capable of forgery grade work, at what point is it an actual forgery? Because you can't control where that guitar goes after it's out of your hands. It could be used to deceive, even if that wasn't your intention. Ian points out that there are people in the violin world who are now advocating for UV additives that fluoresce in their touch-up work, so that it's actually easy to see them under black light, and there's no confusion about what's original and what was added. So yeah, I feel sometimes that the need for originality in a collectible object can sometimes take away from or devalue what is really a more virtuosic performance. Because to effect a good, clean, tight repair on something like this often takes a lot more time and skill than what was used in originally producing the object. These necks came off of duplicating carvers. It's the same machine they used to make stair railings or rifle stocks, that kind of thing. It's mindless work. You just load it and the little thing spins and the wood comes off. Then someone sanded it. When I think of someone like Joel or Ian sitting there for several hours peering through a magnifier, painting in those tiny grain lines, or scoring the surface checking into it to make it look more original. That makes the instrument more valuable, in my opinion, because there's thought and care and fantastic levels of human skill involved. But people want to pretend like the repair isn't there, like it didn't happen. It's the same thing when I see pearl inlays on a fingerboard. A CNC machine can cut both parts now, and they'll fit together perfectly visual perfection on sometimes what is a $300 import guitar. I don't value them the same way I do something that was made in the 1920s by hand with a saw where you can see the effort and the deviations from the profile. I simply refuse. The work of human hands is worth more every single time. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Somewhere under this black lacquer and paint there is a serial number and that number was embossed into a clear lacquer surface. So when I strip off this black, it might go away. Oh, I don't know what to do here. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I'm thinking I'm going to maybe lightly, lightly sand it, trying to see if I can find some ghosting of that number. And then maybe, well, take a photo in raking light so we have a record of it. And then perhaps try and emboss deeper with a sort of a dull implement hopefully denting or compressing the wood surface below that so there'll be a visible trace of the number when I put something on top again. How do I know the Stinger is a later addition rather than from the factory? It can be important as some people attach extra value to guitars with those because they're slightly more rare. There is a lip showing that the black went on top of what was on the neck. If this was original Clear coats would have been sprayed over both the cherry and the black together and polished down level during the buffing process. There wouldn't be a discrepancy in the heights between these two finishes. Because we've got the exposed truss rod there, I can take a second and make note of how much material is actually sitting on top of it. In this case, it's somewhere in the region of four millimeters. 
which isn't that bad actually. I've seen them as little as two and a half. So there's pretty good material here for us to graft on a piece that will cover over this hole and make things more stable. I've been looking at this very intently. I want to understand what happened here before I go jumping in. And I've noticed that there is a line between the black and the rest of the headstock that could be a masking tape mark where the paint piled up against it, or what I think it might be is a seam between a back strap overlay and the mahogany. And down at this end, the break is in pretty much a straight line across the grain, which suggests that this was originally a cut surface here. I'm also looking at the quality of the wood surface inside the fracture. This is important because if this is broken on the actual glue line, which is opened up, um, if it's got polyvinyl or maybe super glue or epoxy in there, I can't use regular woodworking glue and expect it to hold. It won't penetrate. And as the idiom I coined by accident last week says, penetration we know is paramount, for gluing anyway. If this is a contaminated seam, I might actually use epoxy. Someone asked that in the comments last week too. The only time I use epoxy is if I'm concerned that the pores of the wood are flooded with some other barrier, like a previous glue. I'm just going to scrape a tiny amount of this black off along the edge, just to see if I can figure out what this is. There may not be a serial number under there, in which case I'll be less delicate when I strip it. I think that's rosewood under there. Here you can definitely see the line between the black lacquer, what seems to be a rosewood overlay, and the mahogany below. So I'm not going to be precious about this surface here, I'll just scrape and sand it off and get it clean. Uh, and then I'm probably going to route it off again and put on a piece of mahogany. Have a look at the front here. This scrap of what I think is spruce was probably there just to make sure that uh, no glue got in underneath the truss rod. People ask what kind of wax I use. doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a paste wax. This happens to be conservator's wax, which is something they use in museums. Okay, I've stared at this long enough to convince myself that the surface I'm looking at is reasonably clean, and um, I'm going to go ahead and use regular woodworking glue for this. Also safe in the knowledge that I'm going to be cutting portions of this away there'll be stuff inlaid as well for extra strength. Definitely in this area you can see the shine that comes from glue. I'm not seeing that inside this crack. Okay, let's check out the intonation on this white guitar and find out how bad the bridge really is. E's pretty good. Wow, surprisingly the B is too. G's okay. D's a little sharp. So is the A. E's right on. The low E's. Both E's are just fine. That's interesting. The top three strings are pretty much where we want them to be. The lower ones maybe not so much, but there's still room to maneuver with the A and the D. The low E is all the way back, but in this case it's playing in tune, and if we're being honest, there are a lot of Gibsons from this era where it is impossible to actually intonate the low E string because you can't get it back far enough. So what do we do in a case like this? 
I mean, I could pull out the studs, plug the holes, redrill, and move them, what, like a sixteenth of an inch away, essentially the diameter of the stud, drilling right through the same glue line. That would put the saddles closer to the center, but pretty much for cosmetics, you know. I, it's lived and played for 60 years in this configuration. It's playing in tune, and I'm kind of in a mind to leave it like this, if only to prove that some of them were made this way. You know what I mean? Um, Dan Earlywine on a Stumac vid shows a, a sort of a hack that you could do using a second set of um, thumb adjustment wheels. He drills an offset hole in that, puts a second stud through, and they act like little cams so that you can swing the bridge back the requisite amount so that you can actually intonate it if it's really far off. And like I say, there are some that, you know, I would definitely redrill. In this case, we don't need to. It just looks a little weird. It's fine. The dot holes are very enlarged, kind of misshapen, so I'll want to fill them before I redrill and reinstall. And I'll dissolve some binding for that. Uh, this is somewhere in between a white and a cream color, so I'll take scraps of both, snip them up into tiny pieces, and I'll add a little bit of acetone. In an hour or so, they'll have formed a useful goo. This is how to refret at some point. Looks okay. I'm not sure what caused this damage here underneath the binding. Maybe it got tugged on during that process, or maybe it's just simple contraction over the years. I'll probably want to fill these holes a little bit because they're quite deep, rather than, you know, spreading half a teaspoon of that acetone sludge into each one of them. Um, you know, maybe just sort of a skim coat. I got some thin maple dowels and tapped them through my swage block to reduce the diameter. I'll cut these off and stuff them in the holes with some glue. Here's the goo. It's like a paste. This may take more than one application. I want to build it up so it's just proud of the surface. I'll scrape and sand that so that it's pretty level with the surrounding binding. Back to the cherry example, there is no serial number there, just rosewood. I need to make yet another custom jig to cut a patch for the missing wood on the neck. I glue that up out of four pieces of plywood. This is a tough angle because of the length of the chasm. I tape a pad of cork to the neck to help prop up that side of the jig and try and equalize the cut between the angle of the neck and the angle of the headstock. The jig clamps onto the headstock via some machine screws and cork pads. Here I'm checking the depth of cut I can get away with. I have to be mindful of the truss rod in there, and consequently it's not going to be all that deep. It's going to be shallowest in the center right behind the nut, which is not ideal, but them's the brakes. I set the router up and triple check the depth settings. Because of the angle involved, it's not the most stable setup, but it suffices. I take care not to press the router bearings too firmly up against the side walls of the pocket, which could move it out of place. It's all done with very gentle pressure. This neck had a maple spline from a previous repair. You can see I just exposed the metal of the truss rod at the near end of the recess, which is it's not great for the nerves or your router bit. I'll make up an appropriately sized plug out of some mahogany. To get the radius on the corners to match the one cut by the router bit, I basically chop it off with a chisel and then sand so it's a nice smooth contour. And there's a lot of checking to make sure this fits properly, of course. Later on I'll discover that the plug didn't have to extend up into the headstock in this case, as most of it's going to get cut away when I get rid of the rosewood overlay and replace it. Didn't know that at this stage. I clamped it up using surgical tubing. Here I'm drilling for the side dots on the custom. The side of the neck is really rough. The finish on these is quite thick, relatively speaking, as opposed to the clear coated ones, and when it chips it leaves really big gaps. The repaired areas of the binding are not all that easy to drill through either. Uh, the surface is kind of soft and hard, so I usually start the drill bit going backwards to kind of create its own little pilot so that it doesn't catch on the side areas of the binding. I'll try my best to mix up some aged white lacquer. This is pigment rather than a dye, 
and I need it fairly opaque to get decent coverage, which means this stuff becomes much more slow to dry than standard lacquer. You can add drying agents to it, but I've had some rough experiences with those where they immediately crack and sometimes don't get proper adhesion, like it doesn't want to melt into the other lacquer enough, so I tend to just sort of let it do its thing. I haven't trimmed the dots yet. For the fissures next to the binding, I'll apply it by brush. Again, these are very deep, so I'll have to apply multiple coats, and the thickness of the finish layer will take a long time to cure. Here's one of a number of pretty big dings near where the cutaway is uh, on the back side for your belly. Get some more in there with the brush. This actually looks better on camera than it does in person, which is sometimes the way. I'm not trying to fool anybody. <laughs> I'll do some preliminary shaping of the plug and the transition area with the curve of the neck before I go ahead and cut off the rosewood overlay. It's good to do most of this modeling first as it will act as a reference surface to work towards when I'm shaping the new overlay. Here's the jig I'll use to skim off that rosewood. It references off the front face of the headstock and it holds my router base plate in a straight path above it. I'll set the depth of cut to take off a millimeter, but the overlay that is on here is actually tapered, and as it turns out it was canted downwards toward the nut, which gave me some issues. Back to the custom, I'll do some scuff sanding around the damaged area on the heel before spraying. It's been sanded heavily before, and the shape here is a bit irregular. I'll mist the area to be sprayed with a flash coat of lacquer thinner to soften the surface a bit and hopefully make for better adhesion. Then a couple of coats of color. This will make it easier to look at. Back to the headstock. I realized because of the depth of the overlay that was wedge shaped, I was going to be in danger of routing into the truss rod if I tried to do it all in one plane. So I had to do a preliminary half overlay and then put another one on top. Here I'm jointing a piece of mahogany ready for resawing. I'm leaving it quite thick, about six millimeters or so, because then I'll use a spindle sander to reduce the thickness for the bulk of its length, but I'm leaving a generous bump at one end so that I have material to play with when I'm uh, shaping the transition into the neck proper. You can see that here. I took some time to make sure everything fit very nicely together and then I glued it up. Now I can plane down that hump and make sure it blends nicely with the previous plug. I could also use this to shape a volute from if I was of that mindset. But as we've shown before, if you drop it, it'll break right through a volute and this customer wants it to look like it did originally. They didn't have volutes in the early 60s. I'm keeping an eye on the thickness trying to keep it uniform and close to spec. They're usually around like 580 thousandths thick-ish. Carving the transitional arc. Applying water-based pore filler with some brown tint in it. This will get sanded off again. There was one little artifact here from the previous patch that escaped the new plug and it really bugged me. So I decided to cut it out and inlay a piece. I put some cherry red on to bring the new material in line with the old. I do this in several layers, trying to feather the darks in with the lights. This still has to have clear coats, touch-ups, and binding scraped and that kind of thing but I think you can see where I'm going with it. Like I said, you'll always see the repair, especially with transparent colors, but it looks like it was taken care of. The custom also needs to dry and get leveled and rubbed out, but I'll throw some strings on it so we can hear what it sounds like. 